In this video, we're going to be talking about how to connect a PS2 keyboard to a Pico using the PIO block. So the first part of the video is just going to be describing the, the protocol, and then the second half will be actually the code. So when I talk about the PS2 keyboard, that's actually more likely the reference uh, to the connector versus the actual protocol. So it's actually um, called the IBM AT protocol, which was used in older PCs. And because of that, there's actually two kinds of connectors that could possibly, this could possibly connect to. There's the larger five DIN connector used in the older PCs and the standard six mini DIN connector that you'll see on most keyboards that you know have the purple jack on them. If you're looking to Google this, uh, you might also come up as scan code two. If you look for PS2, the first scan code is the IBM XT protocol, which is like vastly different in forms of actual data and even on the electrical side. So electrically, this PS2 signal is five volts with a data line, a clock line, and both the data and clock line are pulled high. So when it comes to the data, the data can be bi-directional. So the keyboard can talk to the microcontroller and the microcontroller can talk back to the keyboard. But at all times, the keyboard actually manages the clock. So it doesn't matter if the microcontroller is talking to the keyboard, the keyboard has to clock in the data. As for what the data looks like, it looks kind of like a UART signal with an external clock, basically. There is one bit that's slow, your start bit, eight bits of data, low to high, one bit of parity, odd parity, which is if you add up all the ones in your, in your data bits, and if they equal an even number, you have to add an extra bit for parity, and then a stop bit, which is high. So now if we were to look at the board sub I got right here, I got one Pico just to program this Pico. I have a PS2 connector that's broken out. There is just one line for power, one line for ground, and then these two data lines going to these level shifters going from 5 volts on this end to 3.3 volts for the Pico. Um, and all these other wires are for testing over here and just a bunch of grounds. So we can close that. And if we open up my, uh, open up the logic analyzer, what we'll see is if we start to run this, we'll see the lines are just high. And if I press a key A, we'll see the start bit here in the green, our data bits the parity bit and this would be the stop bit high. So the way the data gets sent is when you press a key it will send a command and when you take if when you release the key it will then tell you it will send another command saying it's released. So if we zoom out we see that the A key is 1C and the key release is that same 1C with an F0 appended at, the, uh, appended at the beginning. So when you press a key and you, you will get a command and then that same command plus an F0 will be the key release. Now there is one exception to this or at least an add-on is for an extensions to the keyboard layout so there's only a certain amount of keys in total that can be sent out. So to add extra ones, they basically added another byte to the sequence. So if I press the home key, a lessly used key, what you'll see is two bytes being sent. So this combo bytes means the home key. This X zero is the extension key byte and this 67 is in conjunction with this is the home key. But just like the A key once released, you have this extension, this release, and then this 67 plus the E0 as the release for the home key. 
So when it comes to actually sending commands to the keyboard, it's slightly a different uh, process. And just to preface, you'd actually want to send commands to the keyboard to do common things like turn on the LED indicators for the cap lock, scroll lock, or num lock. These things are not handled by the keyboard, they're handled by the device controller. So when I hit the cap locks key, what happens is it just tells me I hit the cap lock key. And when I release the cap locks key, all it does is tell me that I've released the cap key. I have to have code to actually um, tell the LEDs to actually turn on or turn off based on the key press. So what happens is there's a command, in this case the set LED command. Once that gets sent, the keyboard will act. And at that point, I can actually send the actual LEDs to actually turn on, and then it will act again. So to actually send a command, what you actually have to do, because it's primarily a keyboard to device and not host to keyboard, there's a little bit of a process to set up. What you first have to do is you have to pull the line low, pull the clock line low for at least 100 microseconds. And when you pull it back up, you're gonna set the data line down. And this tells the keyboard that you're going to send a command. And at which point the keyboard will eventually figure this out and then start clocking pulses. Now, the data will be clocked on the rising edge instead of the other way around on the keyboard sending. So, on the rising edge, we have our normal data. The start bit's assumed because we start off low. So, we have our normal data, parity, stop bit, and at the last, the last section, we have the acknowledge bit. It, which is the keyboard saying that it successfully got your key press. So basically, once once you've toggled your stop bit, just turn it your GPIO into input to allow the GPIO to acknowledge it, and you should be good. And then least specific commands will have an acknowledgement from the keyboard so all right so now that we've actually seen what the protocol looks like we're gonna actually start looking at the actual code and what I pull gonna pull up is the PIO code because I think that's like the most interesting part of the code so in this PIO example we need data coming in because we need to send commands to the keyboard and we also have data going out so the keyboards sending us data so essentially that's what this first section is all about first I'm saying if there's no data coming in to the PIO block uh, don't worry about it. just go to the next line but if we do have data going into the keyboard, go to this section and start getting the device set up. And the second line is if the data line or if, if the clock line is low, then you're receiving data. If you're not, then just go back to check and then just keep going. Alright, so in the Rx side, what we do is we we have a, a start bit that we don't care about, and then we have eight data bits where we're constantly just looping through, just grabbing one bit at a time, and then we have the parity and stop bit, which I'm currently not checking for, but could be possible. And at the end, what I do is an I set the I send a command to the main CPU to tell it that we received a 
byte of data, and then we start this entire loop again. Now, if we do have data that we're sending to the keyboard, this is where we set up that initial pull down low and then pull the clock high and then pull the data line low. And I do the clock down low basically by just setting this pin direction. So what happens with what what happens is when the clock line's direction is pulled outwards is it's naturally set to zero. So it'll pull the clock line low. And when I change the direction to be an input again, it will set the clock back to its natural state, which is with a pull up. So it'll go back high. And here we're just doing pumping out the eight bits of data or nine bits of data because I added the parity to be calculated uh, on the CPU side. Make since doing calculating a parity bit in PIO loop would be kind of a, annoying. And then what we do is we set the stop bit high and we wait, wait, uh, we wait a clock cycle and then we set the direction back inwards and then we wait for the line, the clock line to go high. And then we start the loop over again. All right. So what this looks like in your main code is what I, the way I got it set up is you initialize the PIO block you want and the GPIO you want to use it on. And then in the background, you set, you override a function that will do all your calls. So in the ATI Pico.c, I have this weak handler that I call whenever I get a, um, let's see, anytime I get a keyboard event, I basically pump it upstream to the user. The cool thing about this approach is that the user doesn't have to manage many of the things that involve with using a PS2 keyboard. So for example, I'm, I have functions to manage the LEDs. So the LEDs are handled by this function up here. So when a key press happens for the caps locks, I do that all in the background. I set the flags for the release and the extension bits. So until you get a full keyboard event, there's no point in you actually doing anything. And it's just another thing you don't have to remember to keep updating. I pass it into the function, so you're all good from that point. Um, what I also do in this call is I have this, let's go here, this PS2 locking union, right? Which will just have the the keys that are toggleable. So what I do is I pass in what the current state of the scroll lock, num lock, cap lock are. So all the user has to do on the front end is just figure out what they want to do when a full keyboard event actually happens. And in this event, I found some guy online who made the mappings for the PS2 keyboard. So what I do is whenever I get a release event, I just send it out as, you know, just over uh, UART. So what this example does is I go here and I just press the keyboard. You know, I just get a bunch of, you know, key presses and shift works, enter works. Oh, maybe. I need like a new line character or something. <laughs> um, but yeah. Now when it comes to actually the configuration of the PIO, I'll give you just a quick rundown. 
So what we got at the beginning is we're setting the GPIO to be pull-ups to fit with the standard of the uh, PS2. Then we're setting up our PIO and down here we're setting all the actual commands where to actually start reading their bits. So we're setting the set instruction to start the GPIO because we need to set both the input <laughs> we need to set both the clock and the data line what what they're reading do we I guess I could get away with that now we're configuring the jump to work just off the clock and that's what this is all about we're telling the clock pin to be the jump pin because that's what we're going to deliberate. That's how we're going to decide whether there's data coming in or not. So we have to set the out pin to be both in clock and data because at some points we'll control both of them. We need to make the shift extra 9 bits and it to be. What is it? Uh, with auto pull basically we're gonna set the in pin to just to start the GPIOs we're gonna set the GPIO pins to be inputs at first and we only need to clock in eight data outwards or inwards and then we have to initialize them since they're output pins, if you don't initialize them, the you can't use them as output pins. Setting the clock to be in line with the PS2 clock range. And here we're enabling the IRQ to actually, the interrupt to actually call a specific function. So that would be this guy up here, our main function. And then we just said go. So not much, not much crazy other than that. So currently I don't have all the commands in there because there's quite a lot, but if anyone wants to add on to it, they're welcome to. Now when it comes to actually the configuration of the PIO, I'll give you just a quick rundown. So what we got at the beginning is we're setting the GPIO to be pull-ups to fit with the standard of the uh, PS2. Then we're setting up our PIO and down here we're setting all the actual commands where to actually start reading their bits so we're setting the set instruction to start the GPIO because we need to set both the clock and the data line what what they're reading now we're configuring the jump to work just off the clock and that's what this is all about we're telling the clock pin to be the jump pin because that's what we're going to deliberate. That's how we're going to decide whether there's data coming in or not. So we have to set the out pin to be both in clock and data because at some points we'll control both of them. We need to make the shift extra 9 bits and with auto pull basically. We're going to set the in pin to just to start the GPIOs. We're going to set the GPIO pins to be inputs at first. And we only need to clock in eight data outwards or inwards. And then we have to initialize them. Since they're output pins, if you don't initialize them, the you can't use them as output pins. Setting the clock to be in line with the PS2 clock range and here we're enabling the 
IRQ to actually, the interrupt to actually call specific, that would be this guy up here, our main function. And then we just set it go. So, not much, not much crazy other than that. So currently I don't have all the commands in there because there's quite a lot, but if anyone wants to add on to it, they're welcome to.